The patrons have spoken in the voice of Gary Cooper, because if you look at the time, you'll see it's High Linoon, at which point an aging sheriff must fight off a group of dangerous Obstagoon. Linoon is usually remembered for its pre-evolution Zigzagoon, a ferocious monster which famously attempted to devour Professor Birch in Pokemon Emerald. Beyond that though, it's mostly been quiet. It usually wasn't an in-game favorite of many, though that changed when it received a Galarian form in Generation 8, a form that then evolved into the truly awesome Obstagoon. Today, we're going to be examining the history of these two in the competitive scene. And so, we ask, how good were Linoon and Obstagoon actually? And in this video, we'll be going over these competitive formats. Linoon exists for the purpose of one set and one set only. With Belly Drum, it boosts its attack up as high as possible in one turn at the cost of half of its health. Once fully boosted, it attempts a do or die sweep with extreme speed, whose priority ideally makes faster Pokemon a non-factor. This is a theoretically optimal use of Belly Drum, as number one, E-Speed is the strongest priority move in the game, and number two, Linoon has Stab on it. As such, it is the strongest possible method of boosting to maximum power and attempting to sweep an opponent's entire team in as short a time span as possible. Just one turn and it's ready to go. Of course, this type of setup requires the entire team dedicated to working together to create conditions where the belly drum can be used successfully. Linoon has a considerably terrible defensive profile, with meager at best defenses and a mono normal type being famous for its defensive uselessness, neither of which mesh well with a setup move that removes half its health. Part of Linoon's setup means after attack has been maximized, it's pumped full of bulk investment as it doesn't need much speed investment thanks to Extreme Speed's priority. But even still, it doesn't take neutral hits well at all, and as soon as the opponent sees Linoon, they're going to be attacking it. There is no secret about what move it's going to use. As such, setting Linoon up involves getting screens, forcing in an already weak Pokemon, then exploding on it without KOing it, so that Linoon can safely switch in without taking any damage and get its drum off. And this weak Pokemon cannot be the one that can Whirlwind or Roar Linoon out, either. And if Linoon runs Lumberry, which means it passes up on the potential crucial extra extreme speed damage provided by Silk Scarf, it can't risk being statused either. So as you may have surmised by now, facilitating a Linoon sweep was the most ridiculously specific thing possible, and it was so boom or bust that it was unreliable on its best day. However, there was one major thing Linoon had going for it surprise. Since most teams will not be using Linoon, nobody expected it, and that was huge for something as devastating as Linoon could be. The surprise factor could potentially augment some of the risks Linoon brought with it. It would never be a consistent threat, but it was worth trying to pull off once in a while, because on occasion, it could destroy an entire team. And really, there's little more satisfying in Pokemon than using one turn to set up than repeatedly clicking extreme speed until you win. With that in mind, Linoon stood no shot in its debut generation of OU, the ever-present permanent Sandstorm permeating the tier completely ruined everything about the already delicate nature of its belly drum setup. However, this problem did not exist in Yu Yu, and it was there that Linoon established itself. The setup was immense, the payoff wasn't guaranteed, but it was potentially worth it to have Linoon shred entire teams. Plus, Yu Yu was far more conducive to a Linoon sweep for more reasons than just the lack of permanent sandstorm. The tier did not pack any extreme speed resistances that were also faster than Linoon, meaning three things. One, Linoon didn't need to run a select bear so it could opt for the status removal of Lumberry, the crucial extreme speed power of Silk Scarf, or even the greater capability of pulling off the Belly Drum in the first place with the extra health of Citrus Berry. Two, by virtue of Kangaskhan's strange hold on the tier, the normal resists running around Yuyu were usually very bulky, and thus quite slow, meaning Linoon with its great base speed barely had to invest any EVs to outrun them, allowing it to invest in a hefty chunk into its bulk, further increasing its odds of executing a successful Belly Drum. Three, if Linoon got to set up, it had a very real shot at sweeping, making the painstaking lengths which one had to go to set Linoon up actually worthwhile. It helped that screen users in Yu Yu were solid overall Pokemon that, unlike in OU, compromised nearly nothing by including screens on their movesets. Soul Rock switched into Tier Queen Kangaskhan and set up Reflect with ease. The lightning fast Electrode had no qualms sliding in light screen, and both of those Pokemon could explode, allowing Linoon to switch in safely while one or both of the screens were still up. Electrode's explosion KO'd nearly nothing, while Soul Rock's uninvested Boom was hardly a KO machine either, meaning that Linoon would not have to try and set up blindly on a potentially unfavorable Pokemon after an explosion doubled down. Teams even tried to soften 
the opposition into Lightning KO range more easily with spikes, which could be fit easily on Amistar and by attacking with their own Kangaskhan. The inherent riskiness of the strategy meant Lightning was a far cry from a consistent Pokemon, especially since it relied so heavily upon the element of surprise. Basically, if an opponent expected Lightning to show up, it wasn't worth using. However, it often wasn't expected as a result of this riskiness, and his team was able to at least set up the optimal conditions for it to set up and go for that all or nothing sweep. Some players even utilized Safeguard on Soul Rock, protecting Lightning from status and allowing it to more reliably forego Lumberry. Setting Lightning up was the hardest part, but we must also examine why Lightning wasn't guaranteed a sweep even if it did manage to survive its belly drum attempt. First, Lightning's base attack stat was not that high, meaning it could potentially encounter trouble grabbing the one hit KOs it so desperately needed. While any commonly used non normal resist would crumple to extreme speed, especially if boosted by Silk Scarf, there were two popular normal resists who were bulky enough to survive even a plus six hidden power ground. The first was the incredibly popular defensive Amistar, who took 80 to 94% from the boosted HP ground and hit back hard with Surf, almost assuredly KOing Line Noon unless the Amistar player made a mistake and attempted this while Light Screen was still active. The second was Golem, who played similarly and could even run Explosion to guarantee Line Noon would go down even if Reflect was still active. Now these two obstacles could be overcome. One could attempt to chip them into range with Kangaskhan and or Spikes, and this was usually a solid strategy. However, it wasn't guaranteed to work. It was dependent on the rest of the opponent's team, especially since that also heavily influenced whether Line Noon could even set up to begin with. What made this even more difficult was that bulky Amistar and sometimes even Golem ran Protect, helping offset such chip damage. Even two layers of Spikes would be invalidated by a single Protect, allowing them to always live the plus six HP ground, and even with three layers, it was still a roll. Though not true checks, the Intimidate users Hitmontop and Grand Bull could weaken Line Noon as once it was no longer at plus six or plus five, it became easier to tank even Silk Scarf Extreme Speech, much less its coverage option. They might have to sacrifice a few Pokemon to get multiple Intimidates off, but it would be worth it, since if they were able to stop the Line Noon, they probably won the game. As if all this wasn't enough, there were also three prominent priority attacks that could finish Line Noon off. Extreme Speed didn't have boosted priority until Generation 5, and thus a Pokemon faster than Line Noon using a priority move would outrun even Extreme Speed. The most common was Scyther and its Choice Bandit Quick Attack. Not exactly a powerful move, but given Line Noon's frailty and the damaging it would sustain while drumming and taking another attack, it would usually be enough, especially since Light Clay didn't exist in Gen 3, and thus screens would run out quickly. The occasional Choice Band Glagger was much weaker, but functioned similarly with its own Quick Attack. The most devastating of the priority moves was Hitmonlee's super effective Banded Mach Punch, which was so strong that it would usually finish Line Noon off, even if it miraculously pulled a Belly Drum off without getting hit and still had Reflect Up. This wouldn't work against the rare Citrus variant, but then again, Reflect was all but guaranteed to be gone by the time Hitmonlee came in, unless its users seriously messed up, and without Reflect active, Mach Punch would easily obliterate even a 75% Line Noon. Line Noon could theoretically outrun Hitmonlee and Gligar, but it would require the loss of a ton of bulk and even a Jolly nature if it wanted to outrun Jolly Hitmonlee, and that made it much worse at both setting up and actually KOing the opposition in every other scenario, so it was definitely not worth it. It was a combination of all of these factors that made Line Noon such a risky pick. Not only did it have a ridiculously difficult time setting up safely, it could have even a successful setup ruined if the opponent packs some of the best, most common Pokemon around. Attempts to remove these Pokemon weren't even guaranteed to work because they were often used in conjunction with each other. For example, weakening bulky Amistar into plus six HP ground range wouldn't help much if Line Noon would just get finished off by Choice Band Scyther's quick attack anyway. And this was all assuming Line Noon got to set up safely in the first place because we must continuously emphasize how Herculean a task this was due to nearly every factor conceivable. For instance, in addition to the million aforementioned roadblocks, there were also spikes. They were great for Line Noon, yes, helping it grab some KOs, but if the opposing team packed spikes, Line Noon would have an even more difficult time safely using Belly Drum, as if it needed any help in that department. As you may have surmised by now, one did not use Line Noon for its consistency. They used Line Noon on rare occasion, when it was least suspected. Because despite the million things that could go wrong, there was nothing that was as destructive as it had the potential to be. Yes, there were many common Pokemon that could put an end to its sweep, but they were not ever present. There were plenty of common, otherwise excellent teams that Line Noon completely bowled over. Many Amistar were offensive, not defensive. Many Scyther were not banded with Quick Attack. Most Gligar were not banded with Quick Attack. Line Noon rampaged through many of the tier's best Pokemon with its plus six extreme speed. Kangaskhan, Vileplume, every water type, Hypno, and more. Additionally, even most bulky normal resists would get destroyed by its coverage. For example, Agron was obliterated by HP Ground, while Soul Rock was crushed by Shadow Ball. So all in all, Lion was one of the most unique Pokemon in Yu Yu. It was the pure
purest embodiment of the concept of high risk, high reward. It was far from a metagame staple, but it occupied its own special place in the metagame, peerless in pure potential power. The immensely power crept fourth generation made simply pulling off a belly drum even more difficult for Linoon, let alone pulling off a belly drum sweep. This was a shame because Linoon got several new boons in Diamond and Pro. Screens could be extended with Light Clay, Stealth Rock was massively helpful in chipping the opposition into KO range, Seed Bomb was great new coverage, and most importantly, Linoon gained the Gluttony ability, allowing it to use Pinch Berries at 50% instead of 25%. This was crucial to activate Select Berry on the same turn it used Belly Drum. Select's speed boost was huge because of the addition of Choice Scarf, increasing the number of would-be faster Pokemon also resistant or immune to extreme speed that Linoon could now bypass. Sadly, this was too idealistic even for Yu Yu. Linoon simply had too much difficulty setting up with all the higher base power moves boosted by Life Orb and Choice Specs, especially when it was starting out at 87.5% tops thanks to the ever-present Stealth Rock. Plus, as a result of the physical special split, it could no longer use hidden power to hit Steel types and thus was walled even at plus 6 by the Registeel that was on nearly every UU team, as well as the Agron and Steelix that were on plenty of others. And to make matters worse, it was still outsped and revenge killed by the popular Scarf Rotom, unless it opted for a Jolly Nature, which would make it even weaker. It couldn't opt for any non Berry items either, unless it wanted to lose to Miss Magius. Linoon was just too gimmicky in UU and thus dropped to NU. And there, its role in the metagame was more reminiscent of its time in Gen 3 UU. It wasn't amazing, but it was threatening once in a while, and thus had its own unique little niche. It was still plagued by the same issues, like difficulty setting up just about anywhere, and coming up short even if it did manage to set up, whether it was failing to KO Cradilly or Magneton or getting revenge killed by Scarf Haunter, whom it couldn't outspeed after a Salak boost without a Jolly Nature. It couldn't even KO Regirock with a plus 6 Seed Bomb, and even a Regirock with zero defense investment would take 89% tops, meaning the odds weren't in Linoon's favor even if Regirock came in on Stealth Rock and didn't heal with leftovers. That said, if Linoon did manage to get the drum off, it was capable of threatening a good number of teams. Its issues barring Scarf Haunter could be overcome with some chip damage, and Scarf was a decently rare Haunter set anyway. Basically, you didn't have to rely on the opponent not bringing half the metagame or letting half their team get KO'd in order for Linoon to do anything. And thus, if one hit it till the end of the game and timed the setup properly, it was occasionally worthwhile. In addition to screen support, Memento Gastrodon was a popular partner, as a Linoon protected by screens and staring down an opponent with minus two attack and special attack would at least be able to drum without getting outright KO'd. It was far from a foolproof or even semi-consistent strategy, as it was much more difficult to pull off successfully than in Gen 3 UU, and it already had a tough time there, but Linoon had its own decent place in the Gen 4 NU metagame, as once in a while you just love watching Charizard, Slowking, and everything else drop to extreme speed. Generation 5 not only continued to flatten Linoon with the crushing grip of Power Creep, but it completely removed one of the few things that can make Linoon actually worthwhile, its surprise factor. With the advent of Team Preview, you would never be surprised by Linoon again. As such, Linoon was forever doomed to utter uselessness. Some players attempted to make it work in RU or NU, but if there was one thing that was easier to stop than a frail normal type trying to use Belly Drum, it was a frail normal type trying to use Belly Drum that you knew would be there the whole game, and no amount of Reflect or Light Screen would change that. Even the fact that Extreme Speed now had boosted priority and would outpace even faster priority users wasn't enough to give Linoon any semblance of a genuine niche. It was too much of a gimmick for even the most advantageous players to use in a serious game. As such, Linoon was untiered in Generation 5. Generation 6 saw Linoon once again unable to salvage a niche even down in NU. But luckily, there was now a new lowest tier, PU. And there, Linoon was terrifying. Even with Team Preview, the metagame was not well equipped to deal with it if it got a belly drum off. And it was actually able to reliably do so thanks to a combination of the tier's general low power level and Citrus Berry's recovery and momentum support from Jump Pluff or Mistravis. Once Linoon set up, it ripped through entire teams with absurd ease, cementing its status as the scariest sweeper PU had ever seen by a significant margin. The best answers the tier had to offer was Magic Guard Focus Sash Kadabra and Choice Scarf Gorgeist S. The former was great, but having it as the most consistently reliable Linoon answer that teams were able to fit was indicative of how utterly monstrous Linoon was, while the latter was really only used because it stopped Linoon, not because it was good at anything else. Plus, Linoon was incredible even when Kadabra stopped it, because as soon as Kadabra lost its Sash, it was no longer able to check another one of PU's most dangerous sweepers, Shell Smash Barbro Go and Karakasa. 
Costa. Alternatively, the Smasher could break Cadaver Stash for a nigh guaranteed Linoon win later on. Linoon completely warts PU around it. The metagame was almost solely hyper offense teams built around supporting its sweep. If you didn't use such a team or didn't use a team specifically engineered to try and counter team them with Pokemon like Perugly or Dust Noir, you were just going to get bowled over by Linoon and friends. So it was never a matter of if Linoon would be banned, it was just a matter of time until it inevitably did. Indeed, it was not long until it received a unanimous quick ban, and sadly, Linoon was unable to find any sort of genuine NU niche, as even if it managed to set up safely, Steelix and Pharisee were far too prominent for his sweeps to ever amount to anything. Thus, Linoon remained in PUBL. However, the sixth generation was definitely a positive one. No PU player would forget the abject terror that came with seeing a Linoon in team preview and being completely powerless to stop it once one of Linoon's teammates used Memento. Generation 7 gave Linoon several incredible boosts. First, there was the addition of the new Pinch Berries that restored 50% health, such as Figgy Berry. Ordinarily, they activated at 25%, but thanks to Gluttony, they would activate for Linoon at 50%, or as soon as it used Belly Drum. This was absolutely incredible. It could finally use Belly Drum without losing any health at all, and this made all the difference in allowing it to set up safely. Second, in Ultra Sun and Moon, Linoon received a massive boost to its coverage in the form of Stomping Tantrum. It could finally plow through Steel types again for the first time since Advanced. It also received Throat Shop, which wasn't as essential, but was still a nice option to have. As a result, Linoon had the smallest of small roles in Yu Yu. It was quite specific, but on certain screen teams throughout the generation, including the incredible new Aurora Veil, or on the more traditional setups by Zatu during the later stages of the tier, Linoon could act as part of the chain of terrifying sweepers, either opening up holes for its teammates like Dragon Dance for Alligator, or cleaning up after its teammates in the endgame. It was a highly niche Pokemon overall, but the fact that it was at all viable in Yu Yu was quite heartwarming, and it it wasn't just viable. It could be quite threatening when sitting at full health after a drum and behind screens, which completely invalidated would-be checks like Mega Aerodactyl, while it naturally cleaved through other popular Pokemon like Latias and Hydreigon. That said, Gen 7 Linoon made its name through its exploits in the RU tier. It quickly proved itself one of the tier's most ferocious Pokemon immediately upon the release of its new coverage moves in Ultra Sun and Moon. Suddenly, thanks to Stomping Tantrum, it was unable to reliably be checked by one of the tankiest physical walls in the whole game, Eviolite Dual Blade. Plus, it was able to find plenty of opportunities to set up even without needing the support of screens, since it was no longer losing its own health to Belly Drum. For example, it could even set up in the face of powerful attacks like Shaman Seed Flare and Gardevoir's Moonblast. Once set up, Lightnoon tore through just about everything, especially since it wasn't too long before Durant was banned and it lost its number one offensive check. The threat of Lightnoon left players constantly fearful. Sure, it had checks like Escavalier, but those were tasked with handling other Pokemon on Lightnoon's team as well, and it didn't take much chip for them to fall into Lightnoon range. Players resorted to highly specialized Pokemon on like Foul Play Porygon 2 or Unaware Pukumuku to attempt to keep Linoon in check, but the threat was always there. Eventually, players started utilizing Linoon on dedicated screens teams, and to nobody's surprise, it made our extremely speedy friend even more absurdly difficult to deal with. The playstyle completely took over the metagame in a short period of time, and much controversy arose in its wake. Many players began calling for Linoon's ban, while others posited screens as the broken factor. Eventually, it was Linoon that was tested. It set up too easily even without screens, and its checks were all quite shaky. As a result, it was banned from RU, seemingly out of nowhere. All it had required was this bit of extra support to go from top tier threat to metagame mauling monster. It wasn't able to make itself a true UU Pokemon, but as previously mentioned, Linoon did have a small niche in the tier, thus continuing to be seen even after its ban from the tier it dominated, which was an improvement on its performance from the previous generation. It wore its RU BL tiering status with pride. It had thoroughly earned it for its prolonged performance as one of the most powerful sweeping picks around ever since it joined the tier. Linoon has had an absolutely wild Generation 8. It started out in RU, where it once again sparked discussions about its potential brokenness, especially in tandem with Aurora Veil. It was stopped by Scarf in DDF, whose Psychic Surge blocked priority moves and thus extreme speed. But beyond that, it was a massive threat. Even though the health pinch berries had been nerfed to restore 33% instead of 50%, this was still enough to let Linoon successfully get a belly drum off, especially under screens. For the first time ever, it could viably run Jolly without compromising too much effectiveness. Being able to beat in DDF was a big deal given how otherwise strapped teams were for options against Linoon, and it could give itself a bit of an extra power boost by running double edge in the last slot against slower, non-normal resistant targets. The popularity of Steelix was a hindrance, but Steelix didn't reliably heal and could thus be overwhelmed over the course of a battle. Linoon was particularly fierce late game. Linoon actually had competition in the belly drum sweep department with Slurpuff, who was slightly better and more consistent overall thanks to unburdening doubling its speed. However, Linoon was still on many players' potential 
ban radar for how quickly it threatened to take over metagames, which could potentially be overwhelming for the metagame. And in the Isle of Armor, that's exactly what happened. The tiering changes seemed almost specifically engineered to make Linoon as broken as possible. First, its eternal roadblock Steelix moved up to Yuyu. Then, in DDF and Ninetales were banned. Not only was no longer having to deal with the former Psychic Surge wonderful for Linoon, but it was much, much easier to support with Aurora Veil now that Ninetales' drought was no longer around to nullify it. With these changes, Linoon went from borderline problematic to outright oppressive. There were nearly no defensive answers, and only Sableye was really reliable, while there was a dearth of viable offensive answers as well. As such, Linoon was banned from RU in a unanimous vote, once again earning the title of RUBL. Then the Crown Tundra came around and its ensuing power creep undid the previous tiers. Linoon went tumbling down to NU, but not for long. After an early wave of bans in the tier, Linoon once again stepped up, supported by screens, and ripped through the metagame with its belly drum boosted extreme speed. With a lack of a sufficient answers on either side of the offensive defensive spectrum, Linoon received another unanimous ban and remains NUBL. That's not the end of Linoon's story in Generation 8 though. It received a Galarian form, which is dark normal and received knockoff. Sadly, Galarian Linoon isn't too great. It's seen some use in PU with an Eviolite parting shot set, but it's nothing special. And it's not PU by usage. It sits in NFE instead. Wait, what? Eviolite not fully evolved? Yes, another addition to the Linoon family in Generation 8 was Galarian Linoon's evolution into Obstagoon. Upon evolving, it lost a bit of speed, but gained nice boost to every other stat. It also received the Guts ability. It could activate it by holding a Flame Orb, which turned Obstagoon's stab facade into one of the strongest attacks around. Its other stab, Knockoff, was similarly vicious, especially since in addition to its power and coverage, it also removed opponent's items, and Obstagoon also received another amazing offensive weapon in close combat. With these three moves, it had perfect coverage and could make itself even more dangerous with its fourth move. It could use bulk up to really turn itself into a one-hit KO machine. It could use its signature move Obstruct to try and bait defense drops from slower opponents, which would then become vulnerable to its attacks. Or it could use Switcheroo to cripple an opposing Pokemon with Flame Orb once it activated its own guts. Receiving something like Leftovers or Heavy Duty Boots was icing on the cake. Obstagoon was a legitimate OU Pokemon in early Sword and Shield, and in doing so made history for the Linoon family. Its speed tier was solid, and it readily threatened the bulky staples of the metagame. With a bit of prediction, it could rip through Carvonite, Toxapex, Clefable, Aegislash, Slash, Seismitoad, and Rhyperior that were everywhere in the tier, and its attacks were made even more threatening by its own bulk up or switcheroo. It was one of the most dangerous wall breakers in OU, and saw plenty of tournament usage. Unfortunately, this did not last. As the metagame progressed, three crucial factors became apparent. One, Obstagoon completely lacked any defensive utility, and this wouldn't have been as bad if not for factors two and three. Two, while powerful with a guts boost, Obstagoon's base 90 attack had a tendency to really let it down when not using the further boosted facade. It usually needed to predict absolutely perfectly, as it would otherwise come up short against its bulky targets like Corviknight. And even Facade didn't automatically drop the likes of Toxapex and Clefable as quickly as Obstagoon would have liked. Three, Obstagoon couldn't take any hits at all, otherwise Burn and Stealth Rock would almost surely finish it off. This severely limited its opportunities, because even when a teammate U-turned into it, it'd be taking 12.5% before it even got to fire off an attack. If Sandstorm was active, it dropped even faster. Obstagoon generally got worn down too quickly in proportion to the damage it could reliably dish out. As a result, its OU usage slowly dwindled, and when Yuyu came around, Obstagoon found itself there. And it didn't last long there at all, though. Yuyu generally did not possess the tools and resistances to pivot around its attacks like OU did. Whenever Obstagoon came in, something would drop. As such, it was banned almost instantly. Obstagoon returned to Yuyu after the Pokedex expanded to the Isle of Armor, and this time, it was able to be a part of the tier without being overwhelming. It became one of the most defining Pokemon in this stage of the metagame. Its primary set was the classic all-out attacker with switcheroo in the fourth slot, but it eventually started experimenting with a set of facade, knockoff, rest, and sleep talk. Dropping close combat was unfortunate, but this set allowed Obstagoon to bypass its number one issue, its lack of longevity. It was now able to barrage the opponent with guts boosted stabs all game long. Its greatest quality was being able to constantly switch into and threaten Galarian Slowbro, which had come to dominate the tier. Having a reliable long-term answer to it that also broke down the opponent's defensive core was absolutely incredible utility, and this came to Obstagoon's most popular set, which defined this phase of Yuyu. Sadly, this too did not last. The Crown Tundra came in, and its expanded Pokedex knocked Obstagoon down to Aryu. Even more sadly, Obstagoon is merely average to mediocre in the tier. It's definitely not outright bad, and its knockoff can potentially be vicious in a metagame where heavy-duty boots are so prominent, 
but the fact of the matter is that Obstagoon simply does not get a ton of opportunities to come in and fire its attacks. So many of the tier's best Pokemon outspeed and destroy Obstagoon, such as Cobalion, Mian Xiao, Noivern, Raikou, and Zarude, to name but a few. When Obstagoon does get a rare opportunity to switch in safely, it is dangerous, but it is highly prediction reliant and gets worn down incredibly quickly thanks to its self-induced burn in addition to hazards. The popularity and power of Togekiss doesn't do it any favors either. Obstacoon certainly started out the generation strong, but as is the case for so many other Pokemon, Power Creep has hindered it. It remains to be seen if it will drop to Enu, or if it will find some sort of new niche in Aryu, depending on potential metagame changes. However, no matter what happens, Obstacoon already had quite a successful generation. And that's it, so how good were Linoon and Obstagoon actually? Well, Linoon has lived and died by its belly drum extreme speed combination ever since it was introduced in Generation 3. It started out as a gimmick that relied on the element of surprise in its first few generations, but over time it received buffs and became a genuine monster even if one knew it was coming, getting banned several times from several different lower tiers, including from RU twice. Many of these bans were the results of unanimous votes, such as Linoon's extraordinary power. In Generation 8, Obstagoon joined the fray and performed similarly. In addition to making the Linoon family's first legitimate OU appearance, it too got banned from a lower tier for its extreme power. Overall, the Linoon family has definitely improved over time, which is wonderful when so many Pokemon, especially normal types, consistently get forgotten and beaten down as the generations pass. Hopefully, the Linoon family will continue to thrive in the future. Thanks for watching, everyone, and a huge thank you to the patrons for continued support of our videos and for voting for this Pokemon for this month's patron pick. And as always, if you like the video and you want to see more, be sure to subscribe to False Right Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And in the comments, I want to know what do you think about competitive Linoon and Obstagoon? How would you buff it to make it OU? What would you give it to have it do something in VGC? Whatever it is, let me know in the comments and follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.